start with just a little um, meditation and then generate a positive motivation. If you could send us your phones, especially volunteers and staff and me. Sometimes online, you can leave your phone on as long as you have your line turned on. We're in Zoom room here also. Yeah. Okay, get comfortable in your meditation posture then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you get, take a few deep breaths and scan through your body, check that out. all the parts of your body are relaxed and uh, soft. And as you exhale, release any tension, tightness, or stress. And then gradually collect your attention inwards and focus on a single object like your breath or just your mind. Um, but focus your attention on a single object and just try to keep it there. Keep your attention focused on one single object without being distracted, without wandering off to think about something else. And when you do catch yourself wandering off, catch your mind wandering, then notice that and um, for the time being, let go of anything, any other objects and bring your attention back to this chosen object of meditation, like your breath or your mind or something. So like that, try to practice placement meditation, concentration meditation for about just um, say two minutes. And then just spend a minute or two checking your um, your own state of mind. 
don't know if there's anything particular bothering your mind or you know what's your what's your mood what uh what kind of what kind of concerns do you have in your mind these days or state of your body as well so just spend a few moments checking checking in with your yourself Yeah. Then break to mind, um, and if you like, you can visualize around you um, your friends and family. So just briefly bring to mind all your, your friends and your family members, your mother and father, the siblings. And then all the people in your extend your your extended community, where you live, or your country, um, yeah, and the world. And then you have gradually all sentient beings, all the human beings, animals, and other kinds of whatever beings exist. And bring them all to mind, especially be aware of any um, anything that any kind of troubles, disturbance, suffering, difficulties that they face. Mm -hmm. So, and then in light of that, in awareness of um, all of all sentient beings, then try to generate a positive motivation that by whatever we do here uh, together during this session and for the rest of the day, may whatever we do contribute to uh, relieving the suffering of oneself and the suffering of all sentient beings. And then also bringing about the well being and happiness of oneself and the well being of one's family, friends, uh, humans in one's community, country, the world, and then all sentient beings. So, first try to spend just a moment generating this kind of universal compassion on one hand, wishing that by whatever we do, may it uh, relieve oneself and all, this, all other sentient beings from suffering. So try to generate that intention. Thinking whatever I do, may I believe all sentient beings from suffering. Not trying to generate a uh, universal love for a moment, thinking, that, well, whatever I do here, may I uh, bring well being and happiness to all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. So with that um, motivation, and if you like, you can visualize Shakyamuni Buddha in the space before you, and we'll recite his main mantra. 
just three times as a way of invoking the blessing of the Buddha to discuss some of his teachings. So if you like, visualize Hakim and Buddha in space before we or just imagine his presence. And then you're welcome to join me in reciting his main mantra if you want. Um, actually, we're going to find some parables. You don't know it in terms of that. Where is it? Somewhere after 167. So in 183, page 183 in the prayer book, if you'd like to join. 183. So again, remember your motivation positive motivation or whatever reason you have for engaging in the session. And then if you like, um, yeah, visualize or imagine the presence of Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, yeah. そう。So imagine from his holy body, light, white light rays radiate out, while uh, purifying you and all such a beings of every form of suffering. Also purifying the, the environment, the natural environment. And then golden light rays radiate out from his body, blessing, blessing you and all such a beings to have every form of well-being and happiness to full enlightenment. And also blessing the, in the environment, natural environment, to become a pure land with the four elements perfectly in balance and perfectly uh, rich and pure and nourishing for the, the well being, the livelihood of all such beings. Okay, so we'll stop the Pimba Night practice there. Just thinking we should do a session on just the meditation on Shaking Muni Buddha sometime. Sometime, usually during like sessions, uh, courses like Tushita and Dharamsala, we do at least one session, two sessions, just meditation on Shaking Muni Buddha, reciting his mantra, and doing visualization like that at the end. But it's really nice to do. Um, yeah, we don't usually do here. <sighs> It's usually we're doing other things in other time. Um, okay, so today's uh, today we're doing this session. It's kind of an unusual topic compared to what we things we usually talk about here, because uh, well, this topic came about. So how to live happily as a couple, um, which is a strange topic for me to talk about because I'm a you know celibate monk for twenty years, so I haven't been in a relationship in a long time. And when I was, I was quite immature, so. Um, so I'm not speaking from experience here much, but um, so this topic came about because actually Shanti Shanti Gopana, our trustee who's looking after the Zoom room now, she oh uh, Shanti I'll need to share my screen later on to just to let me I'm not sure I can do that yet. I have some notes off to share. Yeah, I have to get in the ability. I don't have enough. Um, so I was in well I was in Singapore recently for teachings by. Uh, Lamazo Primache, who's the spiritual director of our center, and um, for yeah, three weeks or so. 
And so when I came back, Shanti was asking me, she asked me this weekend to review some of the things that Lama Zopa talked about. So Lama Zopa Rinpoche, when he was teaching, he'd been asked by, I think some of well, some of the students, I'm not sure there or in Russia, because there was, when I was in Singapore, there were students there, but then online, there were students from Russia who were also hosting the, some of the teaching sessions. So anyway, someone had asked him to talk about, give advice for couples, how to live as a couple happily. So he spent a lot of time talking about that, um, three, I don't know, three sessions or more. So I asked um, Benable Joan, who transcribes for the transcript of his talks, and then I went through and picked out some of the main points. But then, um, you know, well, Lama Zopra his way of talking about how to live happily as a couple is not what you would think, you know, you're going to hear. It's something completely different. Um, and more like advice for people who already quite know a lot about Buddhism. Um, so I picked up some of the main points, more like, you know, about compassion, having a kind heart. Um, but then I thought it'd also be helpful, and I was just curious to see what kind of advice exists in just the, the ordinary kind of uh, world of like psychology and stuff. So I looked up some, um, and I found one good YouTube TED talk about that advice for couples, and then another good yeah video by this, there's this, you might have seen, there's this channel called like School of Life that has quite good advice, also based on psychology. So then I took some points from that too. And it's interesting to see this. I mean, there's huge, huge over between the advice in the kind of secular advice from psychology and Buddhist advice. It's very much, very, very, very similar. I mean, it fits together like perfectly. Um, but I like I find it very compelling to compare, you know, this kind of um, understanding from these two different fields because like psychology, they're not thinking about past and future lives and what meditators have kind of discovered in meditation or something. They're based on mostly empirical studies of behavior in, in people um, and, you know, based on therapists and what works and doesn't work and therapy, and then based on studies of people's behavior and mental affect at different stages in life and different situations. Um, so... Yeah, so one um, pop up on my notes here. Let's see. So, okay. So first, just some of the main points that Lama Zopin Rishi talk about from the Buddhist point of view is, um, okay, so in the talk, I'll talk about, okay, some of the things Lama Zopin Rishi talks about and some of the things from psychology and where they, you know, where they match up. Um, and then some of the other things that, Buddhism talks about and Buddhist advice that you don't find in psychology and then why why the difference, right? Um, because the Buddhist worldview is much different than in psychology, the worldview is just like you're born, you know, your 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 life begins at conception, you live, you know, 80, 100 years, maybe a little more, and then you die, and then game over, right? That's it. Whereas the Buddhist worldview is more like you have infinite past lives. This life, you have the good fortune to take rebirth as a human being, so you can decide, you know, make more deliberate decisions about how you want to be as a person. And then, and then what you do in this life, you create karma, and that karma determines how, how you take rebirth. So when you die, it's not the end. You just, it's just you leave this body, and then your stream of consciousness, and you as a person, you continue on and go into another rebirth. And what kind of future existence you're going to have is very much determined by your state of mind at the time of death and the kind of karma you created. So it's very different kind of worldview. Um, and because of that, then there's very some uh, some different kinds of advice that arise, mostly to do with karma, like in psychology, you talk about karma. Okay. So like that. Okay, there's something in the chat. Sure. It's a bit muffled in my end. Uh, okay. Okay, so so some of the first things, so first, some of the main things uh, Lama Zobra Mishra talked about uh, is compassion, basically, um, as a person trying to be compassionate. So, and the, so how does that, especially, how is that especially important in, in the context of a relationship? And then using wisdom, and then practicing morality. Uh, so as a couple, so as a couple, like trying to be compassionate or as part of a couple, be compassionate. So these are just some of the main points. We'll come back and go through all these in more detail. Um, and we're doing this over, so there's today's session and then tomorrow morning session. And then if we don't finish, we can continue next time. I'll come back also. So no hurry. Um, 
And then, so, okay, so that's what, from the Buddhist point of view, we're mainly going to talk about compassion, wisdom, and morality. Then from the psychology point of view, so there's, yeah, two sets of sort of things, qualities here. So first, there's a psychologist named Joanna Avila. So in case you want to look up her video, she has a very nice TED talk. She's a researcher in the United States at one university, Joanna Davila. Um, so she she says for being, you know, um, I think a healthy, a healthy relationship as part of a couple, um, then one a, a person needs mainly three kinds of skills. One is insight. I'll just name them first and describe them. So insight. Mutuality is the second, mutuality, and emotion regulation is the third. Um, and these map incredibly well with like Buddhist kind of um, psychological methods. So insight here means kind of just being aware and, and being reflective about things about yourself, about things about yourself and things about another person. Like, like being aware of what are the things I like and, and dislike? What are the things that trigger me? that I, I get very upset about easily. Uh, what are the things I struggle with? What are the things I have an easy time with, for example? And then, so having that kind of insight about yourself. So, it's, it, and that arises from having a sort of being self-reflective, right? And that's really the point of meditation. I mean, so she doesn't talk about meditation. Meditation really helps with that. It's just like looking at your own mind and, and trying to, and your own behavior and understanding like how you function, what are your emotional and behavioral patterns that you have. So that's, and the more you understand about yourself, the more you can understand about other people as well. So having insight is one. And then mutuality is, so this term mutuality is like basically being considerate about other people. And so knowing the needs, you know, that your partner has and being, will, being willing to compromise and, and adjust your behavior in order to accommodate both of your needs mutually, right? So being willing to kind of find a middle ground in terms of what, what you need to support one another, mutuality. And then the third is called emotion regulation. So this is really like, this is what Buddhists do like very well. Talk about the different kinds of thoughts and emotions that we have, identifying those are that those that are destructive, like anger and selfishness and jealousy um, and arrogant pride, and those that are, and then trying to reduce those and learning about antidotes, how to reduce negative emotions, um, and then and then identifying positive emotions like generosity and patience, uh, forgiveness, um, and like self-respect and respect for others, and then learning how to deliberately, you know, increase positive emotions and love and compassion, like we were just doing during the the motivation here at the beginning of the session, you know, trying to generate you know the wish that all beings, myself and others, be well and happy. Like that's an example of just a very simple, you know, practice of increasing loving, you know, loving intention uh, or compassion. So, yeah, so there's emotion. So the three that she points out again, insight, mutuality, and emotion and regulation. And then the, um, and then from the School of Life video, they talk about in, in relationships, the importance of what's called rupture and repair. So recognizing rupture, recognizing the in inevitability of disagreements and conflicts. And like arguments in a relationship, which I think we all know. I mean, these kind of devices they don't all, only only refer to romantic relationships, but also you know relationships in our family, with our parents, our siblings, or at work with our coworkers, or you know whoever anybody we meet. Um, and just advice for oneself. So, but in the school of life, video, they talk about rupture and repair, which is is a, is is discussed in real like psychology, not just school of life, especially. I found, a, I found an extensive article about it in uh, related to cognitive behavior, CBT. But so in rupture and repair, rupture and repair. So, okay, recognizing that there are disagreements, there are ruptures in relationship, but then the importance of repairing those by repairing, like after an argument, by learning to kind of um, make up, basically it can make the relationship like stronger than it was before. So it can either be, you know, either it's not healed and you just become further and further apart, or you learn to kind of overcome that, to deal with that sort of challenge um, and, and mend the relationship such that it's even stronger than it was before, is the idea. So there they, they talk about four, four important abilities 
for doing that, for repairing um, a rupture, you know, ruptures in a relationship. And, and again, it's did very well with Buddhist strategy. So the first is the ability to apologize. It's not brain science, right? It's quite obvious. I mean, you need to be able to apologize when you made a mistake. Um, um, yeah, even when you didn't re you didn't recognize it as a mistake, it's just something upsetting to another person. Okay, you need to be able to apologize. And conversely, you need to be able to forgive. When another person apologizes, you need to be able to forgive them and you know have the desire to kind of carry on. So these, these are there are two pairs. So the ability to apologize and the ability to forgive kind of go together. And then the second pair, the ability to teach others. So it means the ability to help someone else, you know, grow their understanding through a difficult experience. Um, I think this is one we really, we really um, undervalue, especially in Buddhism, maybe under discuss. But um, that you know, we're all students. We're all students. We all learn from other people, and we're all teachers. We all know things, and you know, some things better than others. And we have opportunities to help other people learn. Um, so if we if we if we recognize that and recognize that you know in some situations we need to try to make effort to help others learn, um, it it helps us realize I think quickly like I mean I was think one of my main experiences teaching outside of Buddhism was like teaching English in uh, to in Taiwan I taught English to all different people from adults you know in private lessons which is very easy they just want to talk about their personal problems with someone that they don't want to tell anyone else about except their English teacher um, to like little, you know, little five-year-old kids just learning ABC for the first time. Um, but what, well, the main point they make in the video is that when, you, when you're teaching someone, you have to have a bit of, well, they say pessimism. I wouldn't agree to use the word pessimism, but you quickly learn that other people don't learn as in the way and as quickly as you expect them to as a teacher. So you have to really learn to be patient and learn to like, whatever you're trying to help someone else learn, break it down into bite-sized parts that, and then just feed it to them, like feeding an infant baby, like one at a time, slowly, and don't give them the next spoonful until they've eaten and just the first spoonful. Otherwise they become overwhelmed and it becomes a mess, right? So, so we, we have to, you know, in a relationship when things rupture, you know, it's not that we always have to think, oh, I know better and you know less and I have to teach you something, not like that. But but when when we see something about it, you know, what caused that flare up, that disagreement, um, that, maybe be, that maybe we really think would be helpful for the other person to know, we have to learn how to share that, express that in a way that is going to be kind of acceptable and, and seeable by the other person and also find the right time and the right place right to say um so anyway we'll come back to that we have to have the ability to teach and also the ability to learn right so we also have to recognize that we don't know everything surprise surprise right that we have a lot to learn um from other people um and so have that kind of humility okay so there's so again there's four abilities that point out ability to apologize ability to forgive ability to teach and ability to learn. So, so now I'm gonna take um, some of the main points that Lama Zobar Mishay made in his talk and then fit all of these together and do some meditation as well, slowly. Okay, so, okay. so the first point Lama Zobar Mishay made, actually I'm kind of, well, yeah. This is not the first point on Zoom Rishi. I took out some of the main. So this is the first of the main points I took out. Two birds. Two birds. The what is it? Learning to apologize and forgive go together, and then teach and learn. Okay. So yeah, because Lama Zubrimashe, when he gives a, a teaching, usually it kind of goes all over the place. There's a lot of different stories and, and things. So I just took out some of the main points. Um, so the first is that real happiness comes from a good heart, right? Practicing a kind heart. So this is, yeah, and this also is point as holiness makes. So, you know, thinking, 
Uh, we'll check. I mean, this is what we'll meditate on a little later is to check if it's true or not. But in a relationship, any relationship of another person, I think, you know, the, the main, the most important thing for it to be, you know, mutually enjoyable um, and, and for it to be stable and long lasting um, and, and kind of grow and grow in terms of having trust and mutual respect, mutual respect and growing in terms of, you know, understanding each other, you know, knowing each other more and more and thereby understanding each other better and better. It's just, you know, basically just being kind, you know, being kind hearted. Um, so, and not being kind, like, because we want to get something, because we want other person, other people to like us, or because we want to have more friends, but just being genuinely kind, because we, you know, we feel like that's how we want to be as a person. And why do we want to be like that as a person? Because we like it when others are kind to us, in short. So, um, so the first thing, yeah, is just having a good heart, being kind heart, being good heart. Um, and this, and this relates back to, and what Lama Zorbrusha says, couples, I'll quote, couples life, couples life, uh, the meaning, the purpose is to be together, right? So as a couple, that's what it means, to be together, just to, um, to agree to like share your lives together as, as a couple. Um, but the purpose of that, what's the purpose of sharing your life with another person? It's because you want happiness. You want to be happy as a person. So and that doesn't, that's not only true for couples. Like everybody, I mean, this is Buddha's fundamental, I mean, almost like an assumption that the, the Buddha, you know, in all of his teachings, he just assumes this, um, that this is the case. But it's a very important, it's something that, you know, His Holiness Dalai Lama, you know, reminds us to, to think about, to reflect upon, and to, um, to try to understand more deeply, um, you know, in, in in, in our practice as a Buddhist or just as a human being, as, as a person. And so this is the basis of, of secular ethics. This fundamental observation that, that every sentient being, so sentient being means any person who has a mind, right, who has a consciousness as he wear. So that every sentient being, on the one hand, they want to be free from suffering. They want to avoid pain, physical pain or mental pain, um, and all, and you know, from from simple illness up to the most complex kind of problems, um, that we all want to avoid different kinds of dissatisfaction, it's a more subtle sort of suffering, but any kind of suffering, we want to avoid that. We don't. We don't want. Um, and conversely, on the other hand, we want well-being and happiness. You know, we want we want pleasant feelings in our body, pleasant feelings in our mind. Both in the short term, like a temporary, you know, so maybe some, in some cases superficial or very short lasting kind of happiness. But we also want long term, you know, happiness, deep satisfaction, contentment, um, and, and a sense and a, a, a sort of a wholesome sense of, of joy, you can say, about who we are, about how we are in the world about, yeah, kind of about our life. You know, we want a sense of satisfaction, well-being, and joy, and ideally one that, you know, the long, the more long-lasting and profound and uh, kind of blissful, the better, right? You know, is there any limit to, you know, if you think about the best possible happiness you could have, is there any limit to that, you know, what you can imagine? Um, so, so all of our endeavors as a human being I mean, this is a big question, but the Buddhist assumption is that everything we do as a sentient being is either for the purpose of avoiding suffering or for acquiring well-being happiness. So, of course, as a as a couple, I mean, we don't why why do we you know why do we create a relationship when we're not in a relationship? Why do we create to get into a relationship? Right? It's because we as when we're alone, we feel lonely, right? Or we feel like, yeah, I mean, the world is, is, can be a very difficult place. It can be a very threatening, kind of scary, um, bewildering environment, you know? So it can feel, you know, what can you imagine, like being all alone in the world? I mean, which is just to think of that, you know, someone, 
someone who maybe has lost their parents, who doesn't have any siblings, who doesn't have any relatives to take care of. Them. It's one of the worst, most, I mean, I mean, realistic, that's one of the most dangerous, but also one of the saddest kind of situations um, to be in in the world. So all of us, you know, as human beings, especially we're social creatures, like we need support from, you know, from the time we're an infant and, you know, all the way until we're, we're, we're an adult, we're an old age, you know, person. We need support from others. As a young child, we need the support of a, you know, a loving a caretaker, whether it be our parents or grandparents or, or others. And then, um, you know, as an adolescent more, we, we want to sort of be independent from our family, but we, friendships become very important. You know, we need, we need friendships, um, the support of peers and friends. And then as we get, as we get older, we need, you know, we want a more kind of intimate relationship I mean, for most people with, uh, you know, with a um, sort of more intimate partner, someone who we feel we might want an exclusive, an exclusive relationship with a, with a companion, someone that we feel we can share like everything with and that they will share everything with us and we can be this kind of part of this intimate um, um, union of, you know, with another person, which is a very special thing as well. And then in old age, well, if we have children, we want to have the support of our children. So as human beings, we're naturally we're, we're social creatures. And so in all the relationships that we have, from you know, when we're young with our parents to our friends to an intimate partner, extended family, or whatever, in all those relationships, you know, we don't we're not involved in those relationships because we want more problems. We want more conflict in our life. We want more like complication and drama, right? Um, well, I mean, many of those relationships, it's not like we choose to be involved in, we just are involved in, especially with our family, but especially the ones that we choose to be involved in with friends, uh, with a, with a, in, uh, with a, a romantic partner. We, we're involved in that relationship because we want happiness. It's for the purpose of happiness. So this is Lums Overmache's observation here is, you know, it's the, the relationship is for the purpose of well-being and happiness. That's why we choose to be in a relationship. So, but then we need to think: Well, how can we create happiness through that relationship and well-being? Um, so, Rimshi goes on to say, "But, but you must know. So, what's the way to be happy? Like how to be happy?" Um, so, so here we can relate that back to this. So, we need to bring bring a kind of wisdom relationship is. We can't just assume that because you know, we see someone and we feel good about them, then that as long as we're with them, we're going to keep feeling better and better and better. I mean, that's a very naive uh, kind of outlook, you know, and that'll lead us into disappointment again and again. Because just because, I mean, even if something, even with something as simple as food, like just because it tastes good at the beginning doesn't mean you keep eating it or drinking it, it's going to make you feel better and better and better. That's like so ridiculous, right? So with relationships with other people, of course, it's the same. Um, so this is where we need we need to use wisdom to understand how can I, you know, find more happiness for myself in this relationship with the other person. But but because it's a relationship, it depends upon you know it's it's it takes two to tango. It depends upon both of you being involved. So we also have to think, well, how can I also? And this is more important actually for happiness. How can I, through this relationship, bring more happiness to the other person, right? To this other person. Um, um, so because it's often it's not an obvious thing, right? So here, this so we need to use sort of wisdom to understand, you know, together in a relationship with this other person, how can you know how can we work together to create more happiness? Now, as I've been preparing for this session, I keep thinking about. Okay, I'm going to talk to a room full of people who are interested in Buddhism and the Buddhist path about, you know, how to be part of a relationship. And one of the questions I know is going to come up, you know, it should be coming up for you, all of you already, most of you, except maybe those who come as a couple, right? But like, okay, because in most couples, okay, I'm interested in this, but my partner is not, right? So how do I, what do I do, right? Um, and the answer is, I think basically, then you use what you know what you can learn in this kind of context to be you know to be the best you can in the relationship and then try to set a good example right? 
I mean, there's all the things we're talking about. It doesn't mean you're whoever you know your partner is, they have to be on board for all the same things because most of it's quite common sense things. And also, if you can become a more mature, more well-informed, more wise um, person in the way you interact in the relationship, naturally that's just going to make both of you more happy, right? Um, and then if, and also if you can make real dramatic change in the way you are involved in the relationship, then naturally the other person, again, whether it's a romantic partner or whether it's a sibling or a family member, the other person will notice and also be interested in what, you know, what are you doing? How is it you're coming to this kind of um, insights or conclusions or changes that you're making? And then, you know, it doesn't mean you'll have to, they'll have to become, get on board with Buddhism or whatever your strategy is, but, um, but it can open up, it can make space for learning from each other, dialogue. Okay, so here though, so this bringing, having, so understanding that in a relationship, the purpose of the relationship is to bring about more well-being and happiness, right? But to do that is not necessarily, how to do that is not necessarily easy or straightforward. And so we need to use wisdom. So this is the same as, this is what Lanz Obermache said, but what does it remind you of in terms of the psychologist? Insight, right? The first strategy of this, this um, was very, Joanna Davila, yeah, Joanna Davila. The first thing, and she, those, those three skills she's talking about, um, insight, neutrality, and emotion regulation, I forgot to mention. Um, it's based on her research of a kind of meta survey of many, many different research, research many different, um, what is that? Um, I guess not experiments so much, but I guess investigations and studies, as I've heard before, many, many different studies in psychology about what makes uh, healthy relationships. So of, of people in different, different types of relationships and different age groups. Um, and this is kind of bringing together the main, the most important skills that seem to be um, uh, prevalent, prevalent, prevalently sort of uh, identified in all of those studies, or these three. So here, insight. So this insight and wisdom, basically the same thing, being more attuned to, more uh, sensitive to, and more reflective, which means like thinking about, being reflecting about what causes suffering and what causes happiness, right? What kinds of behaviors, ways of relating, ways of interacting bring about more conflict, more suffering? Um, and what brings about happiness? And here again, there's a difference. I mean, as we as we unfold this more, there'll be a bit of difference in the perspective of psychology versus Buddhism, because Buddhism is largely talking about um, karma and how so much of our suffering and happiness comes about through karma that we've created in the past, and then by uh, by especially acting in an ethical way in our behavior, um, being uh, primarily being mindful not to harm others and to benefit others as much as we can. We create positive karma such that we experience more and more happiness in the future, in the future in this life and also future lives. But um, yeah, I'll just read a bit what the next point Mama Zopra Mishay makes. Yeah, is this. The conclusion he says, the essence, practicing a good heart um, that, that is happiness. So just practicing a good heart, just having the intention to, yeah, to be kind, to be helpful um, to another person itself brings about happiness for oneself. Um, real happiness comes from a good heart. So real happiness comes from, you know, just wanting to be a kind hearted person. That brings the best sort of satisfaction to oneself. Um, even the other person, even if the other person is very selfish, right? So if you, you're very kind hearted and very, you know, altruistic, concerned about the other, but they're very selfish. They learn from you. Right? They, they learn from you. So we can, yeah, we can think about that a bit more, but um, you can be an example to so many people about how to practice a kind heart. So in a relationship, um, yeah, is it true that, you know, that by practicing being kind hearted? So what does being kind hearted here mean? It means on the one hand, um, not, not never generating the wish to harm, 
right? What's the opposite of being kind-hearted is having, you know, having the intention to harm a person. Okay. So the first is recognizing that, you know, just as I don't want to be harmed, there's whether verbally or of course physically, you know, don't need to mention even, but even mentally, even I don't want the others to have you know harmful intention toward me, have ill will towards me, have the wish that you know misfortune and pain and and um, and um, um, and suffering befall me. I don't, I shouldn't even you know have the the mentally the wish to harm another. So so first of all, I mean the sort of almost like the very foundations for practicing good heart is in you know being mindful in all in every circumstance, no matter what arises, no matter how and what is really difficult is when we feel like we're really being mistreated by others. But we have to sort of build up the armor of patience such that no matter what happens, no matter how hungry or thirsty or disappointed or you know unhappy or miserable I am, that I never let that become in the, the intention that others, you know, that others suffer. Um, so, so never generating ill will, never generating the wish to harm others. And then, of course, you know, trying as much as we can in our speech not to harm others. And then, of course, with our physical actions, not to harm others. So, first of all, just practicing good heart, the basis is, you know, not harming, not harming any, any and not harming not only other human beings, of course, those that are close to us. But you know, ironically, those are the ones we're most likely to harm. We most harm, isn't it? So we have to check out why is that. But it, it helps even to begin with you know smallest animals, you know dogs, cats, you know insects around us. If we practice like not harming towards the mosquitoes, mosquitoes trying to bite us instead of killing it, just shoo it away or try to catch it and put it outside the room, or you know ants and and cockroaches in our kitchen or something instead of putting putting out poison. Try to put out some kind of you know herbal spray or something. There's a very good one actually in India by your company. Oh, I don't remember. I'll mention it later. I just discovered recently. But there's a lot of anyway. There's a lot of uh, home remedies like turmeric powder and cinnamon. It's very good. Um, but for like you know prevent insects from coming to the sweet stuff in your in your house or whatever. Or just sweep every day so insects don't come. But try to you know in in any situation by practicing you know. Because insects, they're not like, they don't trigger us like, you know, like our parents do or like our siblings do or our neighbor does or stuff like that. They're very simple, right? So if we can practice, we, but this, but the mind of like wishing to not harm is the same, right? So if we can practice towards this very simple situation of like when mosquitoes come to bite us or there's, you know, ants in our, in our, in our room, we can practice, okay, not harming and trying to, you know, Kind of be able to cohabitate in a, in a mutual, um, mutual kind of agreeable way towards them. Then you know that we build up the habit, the mental habit of not harming. So even when you know the maybe I don't know the, the person next to us in our office or something is doing something really annoying, um, then we also remember this is a sentient being. They want they want they don't want to suffer. They want to be happy. So I should try to deal with them, even though I'm getting annoyed. How to deal with them in a way that's not hurtful you know, to them. Okay. Um, so the basis of practicing a good heart is not generating, you know, or generating the habit, the mental habit of not harming others, right? Just wishing to not harm in all circumstances. And then from top of that, as much as we, and that's the basis of, of morality in Buddhism, is based upon this fundamental recognition that all creatures want to be free from harm, they don't want pain, they don't want to suffer, then we should not harm them. And then, and then based upon the observation that all other, just like I want to be happy, I want to be healthy, well, you know, at peace, at ease, you know, enjoy life. Um, and, and also, and not only enjoy life, but I'll have you know deep inner like, satisfaction and joy. Other all other creatures are the same. So generate as much as possible the wish to benefit others. You know, to help others in, in whatever way we can, to bring happiness to others, to bring well-being to others, to care for others, to nourish and support their physical and their mental life, right? So, the, so, so just here, coming back to a relationship, and then we'll meditate a bit, um, you know, in this relationship with, with, you know, a special person, a romantic or whatever, a husband, a wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, just try to, in the first thing, it's the most essential thing you could think 
And then everything else is just kind of a, a branch, a variant, a tangent of this is in the relationship always try to not harm in, in whatever, in what, no matter what happens, no matter what arises, no matter what discussions arise, no matter what disagreement arise, um, no matter you know what betrayal, you know whether they betray you or they malign you, or no matter what happens, try to not harm, don't harm the person, and then and then try to benefit as much as you can. Try to, um, um, yeah, have have a mind of concern and caring about the other person, such that you know you genuinely want to benefit them as much as you can. Um, and I think if, you know, if we can act like that, if we can behave like that, then, then we feel happy about, about ourselves, about what, whatever we're doing. Even if you know, it turns out you know, we break up or whatever, we don't have anything to be ashamed of. Even if the other person may, for whatever, for whatever reason they leave us, at least you know, we can feel like we, we did our best. Of course, there might be other things, but whatever. But we feel if we if we act in, in that way as a person, I think we can feel good about ourselves as a person. So that, is that why we act in that way? No, that's not. That's not. We're not saying that's why we act in that way so that I can feel good about myself. That's just a, a side benefit that comes you know, by the way. The main reason is just because you know other you know other, the other person in the relationship are the same as us and wanting to not. You know, not wanting to suffer and wanting to have happiness. So, because that's that's what. How would I like to, others to treat me? Treat me in a way that doesn't cause me to suffer and that supports my well-being and happiness. So, how should I create? How should I treat others in the same way that I want them to treat me? Simple. So we'll stop there and do some meditation. Oh, sorry, I've been sharing my screen the whole time. So, I can see. Okay. yes, um. No, let's meditate just for 10 minutes first, and then we'll have a break. Okay. I'm always afraid of distraction alert. Okay. So again, take a few deep breaths. Get comfortable, maybe wiggle around a little bit, and then settle down in a in a yeah a way of sitting. You can just sit still. So we'll just do a short meditation. Just uh, five or ten minutes. So again, gradually gather your, your attention, your, the focus within. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you're welcome to think about actually anything that I've been presenting. You know, if there's something you feel like you really want to think about, need to think about immediately right now, and you're welcome to do that. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll make some suggestions of ways to yeah, reflect during this meditation. So the first is just to try. Uh, so one fundamental um, assertion that Buddhist, uh, Buddhism makes is that all sentient beings are the same in wishing to be free from suffering, uh, pain, and harm, and wanting to have well-being and happiness. So I'd ask you to, to check if that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, is that true for yourself? So maybe in the context of thinking about the relationship and look in a and as a couple, part of a couple, then first check is that true for yourself, and then check if, is that true for your um, your partner, the other person you're involved. In. All right. 
So maybe for a couple minutes first, just reflect on yourself or you can, yeah. So again, is it true for yourself that you wish to be free um, from, from suffering, free from pain and harm? And what does that mean? Is it true and how, how so? And then is it true that you want to have well-being happiness? Um, yeah, so first reflect on that for a couple minutes and then I'll remind you, then reflect um, on that in relation to um, the other person. And then, then finally, I guess the question will be, and is that, is that the purpose of this, of the relationship? In college? So first yourself. Yeah. And then think about in relation to the other person. If you're in a relationship, then you can. Or, or any other person that you have a close relationship with. Is it true also for them that they wish to be free from suffering and to have happiness? And what are the different shapes that takes?
Fiber. Um, um, so from she makes this observation that the purpose of being a couple is to have happiness. So we can ask, is that true or not? That's part of our meditation. Um, and then he goes on to say that the, the, the primary, the essential way to have happiness is practicing good heart. So having the intention to have heart to the benefit as much as possible. So can I ask this set of questions about a relationship? Is it true that the purpose of the relationship is to have, you know, to have happiness together? And what is essential for having, if that's true, what is essential? What is most essential for creating happiness together? Is it a good heart or something else? So reflect on that for a few minutes. meditation, just try to reflect on everything you, yeah, you've heard and you've meditated on, especially in the last 10 minutes, and try to come to some kind of conclusion for yourself. If there's anything, especially if there's anything you'd like to remember in the future. Okay, then we can um, relax your attention there and stop the meditation. Um, so I think now we'll take a short break, 10 minute break. And I think there's some refreshments there. And then we'll have some discussion, question and answer, and then and we'll see what happens. Okay, so we'll have a break, a 10 minute break now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so why one, uh, you know, uh, I understand the philosophy of saying that one must not do any harm, we should strive for collective good. Um, is it possible? I think, I mean, I personally experienced that as well. Like, I would think that I'm doing the right thing and I'm coming with the best intentions, but it's not perceived. Mm -hmm. In the best way, or the other poor party does, and there's mm -hmm. a certain reaction to that. Mm -hmm. So, how does one reach an equilibrium in that state where you think you're doing the right thing, but there's clearly like um, you divide it on the top? Right. Okay. So, I'll repeat also for people online here. So, okay. So, let, let me make sure I got your question straight though. So, you, you feel like, okay, I understand the philosophy of trying to not harm and trying to always do good. 
But what happens in a situation when you feel like you're trying to do something that's good and helpful, but the other person feels like it's not helpful and they, they don't want you to do that, basically. Right? Yeah. Um, well, that's where the, that's where wisdom comes in and in insight. Because it's not enough just to have a good intention and just do whatever whatever seems good. Like we have to use kind of insight or wisdom to investigate, well, what's actually going to be helpful. And then not only maybe what's actually going to be helpful, but what's going to be acceptable, especially when it involves another person. What's going to be ex what are they going to perceive as helpful? Because if the other person, even something is helpful for them, but they don't perceive it as helpful, it's just going to upset them, right? And make them unhappy. So that's where, yeah, we, that's where, that's one of the most difficult things, but also where we have to learn to be like really, really, uh, I mean, we say skillful all the time, but means really, because too often, I think when we try to help another person, we do so from within our own worldview, our own understanding of what's good, and what's not good, what's helpful, without really taking the time. And, and it can easily be a very, um, well, it can easily be quite an ego-driven thing where like, I want to be a good person and I can see they have a problem and I know how to help, so I'm going to do this. It's I, 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 me. It can easily be really about me and what I want to do to help them. And they're just kind of, a prop there so that I can play out my fantasy of being a superhero or something, right? So we really need the compassion um, really means like, we really need to check, are we really caring about them? If we really care about them, we need to let, let go of our whole trip about me and my life and what I want to do and really try to imagine what it's like to be them, you know? Really, really put ourselves in that person's shoes, right? really try to understand like what's going on with them what why you know if they have a problem why why are they facing that problem what's happened in their whole life history what what's their what are their opinions what's their way of thinking about this what you know what other things are happening in their life like usually we don't really take the time to stop and think about all those things and how you know all the complex details of that other person's life you know I mean, this happens all the time, only in, in you know in couples and personal relationships, but also between countries. Like one thing that pops to mind is how, I mean, like I'm not American, I'm from the United States, and people in the U.S. are you know world over known as like the people who are very almost it's like almost to an annoying extent. Extent they want to go around the world and help solve everyone's problems. I mean, and really get really nosy, like really kind of. And arrogant in a way, an arrogant kind of helpful. So they just go to a place and like the Peace Corps, even the Peace Corps, which is like, okay, leave aside the military and the, the State Department, and everything, even the Peace Corps, which is kind of the most, one of the most innocent branches of the US um, government activity, is like, even there, they like go to a third world country, think, okay, you guys don't have wells. We're, we know this technology, we're going to come in and just build all the wells you need. And then Five years, you know, it doesn't help anybody. It's just a big pain for the community. And then five years later, nobody's benefited, which is a total waste. So, and that that comes from like not really taking the time to understand like how do those people live? Why do they have that kind of problem? What are the, from their point of view, what would be the best solutions? And how can I help with that? So in an interpersonal relationship, it's the same. And to take time to really understand the other person and really, because because usually, you know, how many people really deeply understand you, you know, us? We're, I mean, we're each of us, we're very complex people. Like, it's not easy for anyone to really understand us and really understand how to help us. We, I mean, how many times have we felt like someone else is trying to help us and they just, they, re, I know they have a good intention on the outside. It seems like it's something good, but that's really not what I need right now. Just like, go away, <laughs> you know? Sometimes we just need space. We need peace. We don't need, like, help. So, um, I mean, sometimes the best help is just for people just to leave us alone for a little while, right? So, yeah, in short, I think without going on and on and on, then it's like that. You know, we need to have a good, it's good, it's, we start with a good intention, that's a good start, but we need to use wisdom to understand what, you know, what really would be most helpful to the other person. And then, and then, yeah, according. 
Okay. So now I have one question here online. I'm going to go between the two from one of the people in the Zoom room. Their question is, it's in the chat box. I come across two common beliefs from couples who break off relationships. One is to keep in touch and one is to cut ties. What do you think Buddhism would say about both the philosophies? So what would Buddhism say? When you break up or go separate ways, should you keep ties or should you keep in touch? Well, the Buddha said in the sutra, I'm just joking. I don't think the Buddha talked about it. <laughs> I wish I could just like quote the Buddha from some sutra. Um, well, we can look at the Buddha's life because he had a big breakup in his life. Do you all know the story of Buddha's life? Yes, yes, yeah. He was married and they had a child together and then he left. You know, he was a very, he was a deadbeat father. Um, shouldn't say about the Buddha, but um, that's what we would say now. Um, but, but um, well, I mean, he, he cut ties for a while, for like six years or so. But then after achieved enlightenment, he went back and then, you know, um, well, then then uh, got in touch again. And then, and then yeah, Yashodra was actually one of the first bhikshunis, one of the first women to join the monastic order. Um, so, yeah, became a teacher, a disciple relationship. But that's very unusual. Um, you know, I just think there's, there's not one answer, no? Do you break up or keep ties? There's not one answer. It all depends on the circumstances. Just, I think whatever you feel is, whatever you mutually feel is right and seems kind of helpful. I mean, I think generally, you know, well, maybe one thing that, that's helpful to remember here, um, from the Buddhist perspective, like, we're always together with every sentient being. We never, you know, we're all part of the same world. And as being, you know, as sentient beings, being part of the same world, we've always been part of the same world from beginning this time. You know, in the Buddhist perspective, as you know, each of us individuals, so just think of each of us individuals in the room, in the Zoom room, like, what are we as a person? Mainly, we're, we're a continuity of consciousness. Like this body, it, it only lasts for a short time. And then the consciousness, you know, as there's a, well, I don't know, there's, there's a continuity of consciousness and a continuity of the person that's labeled upon the consciousness. Now, don't worry about that for now. Just think consciousness is fine. It's not only, it's not quite that simple. But so there's a continuity of consciousness, it means a stream of consciousness. It, it's moved in our experience, we've experienced it moving from, you know, childhood through each day, each moment to this life, you know, I mean, to this moment now. You know, just think about the moment when you came into this room or you sat down, you know, to, to at the beginning of the session till now. Like we've moved through all our consciousness, stream of consciousness, moved through all these moments. It's moving right now. You know, it'll move into the future. Eventually, we'll leave this room and go to somewhere else. Blah, blah, blah. So, and then eventually this body will become old and decrepit and, and then parts of it won't function anymore and it'll die. At that point, our consciousness will separate from the body. And then it'll go on to an in-between state and then it'll take rebirth somewhere as some kind of creature and then have another life. But in the Buddhist perspective, and that happened before this life as well. Like before we were, you know, at the moment of conception in our mother's womb, our consciousness was somewhere else. And then it entered into, you know, the fertilized egg cell at the moment of conception. But before that, it was, it had just left a body and it was somewhere else, right? It was in an in-between state. And then before that was in some other rebirth. So... This stream of consciousness, according to Buddhism, has no beginning, right? Each of our, as an individual person, each of our individual streams of consciousness, it's not like there was just one big ocean of consciousness and then this little triplet, like streamlet just broke off from that. Not that. Each of our individual streams of consciousness is beginning less because you, you can't posit the beginning. How could consciousness arise from something else? Um, and also has no end. So as a person, of course, in every life, we're not like the person we are now, this kind of body and the name and family and whatever and appearance that we have now. But but we're the, part of the same stream of consciousness. So my point is, basically, we're in the we're, and, and we're in the world with all these other sentient beings, and we're intimately related to to each other. 
right? We're, from life to life, we have different relationships. You know, in any one life, most other sentient beings, they're strangers to us. We don't know them. But in any one life, we have many friends and family, right? Who we we have different kinds of relationships with, yeah, enemies too, whatever. But but then in each life, it's different. It's different people. So in a way, it's like. Well, I guess one, one way to think of it is like this. Whatever, whatever animosity and kind of um, conflict we have with another person, um, it never goes away, actually. So we have to just resolve it eventually because, you know, we might think, you know, like I, used, I remember when I was young and when I was younger before I knew anything about Buddhism, uh, or had thought about this question, then I thought, well, you know, these people I really don't like, if I can just avoid them until either I die or they die, then the problem will be resolved, right? Because we're dead and we'll never meet again. But actually in the Buddhist worldview, that's totally not the case, right? If we have a conflict with another person, we have, I suppose we have anger at another person, they have anger at us or whatever, we have this conflict, even we die, the karma is there, we've created karma. Uh, through you know acting with uh, malevolent intention, through acting with that mind of animosity or whatever, and so um, that karma doesn't go away. So through the force of that karma, then in the future life, we'll and one, the karma doesn't go away, and, and two, we're we're still in the same world. So eventually, we're going to meet the person again, right? It's not like it's not like we just stop to exist when we die because stream of consciousness, which carries all the imprints of everything that's ever happened to us before is still there. So eventually when the karma ripens, we'll meet with that person and that conflict will continue. So the way to bring peace, ultimate peace, is to resolve all conflicts. Like you can't, you, peace doesn't come about through, through dying, right? Um, that just, it just kind of is a pause in the game, you know? And then the game picks up when you both take rebirth and you meet again, event, which eventually you will. So that's why this whole I mean, Dalai Lama, I mean, that's one reason he's always saying, you know, I mean, um, I mean, he doesn't even talk about karma, but of course, karma is kind of there in the background that, you know, peace can't come in the world through war and violence and conflict. Peace can only come about through overcoming conflict, through dialogue, basically, and, and mutual understanding and coming, coming to, you know, mutual respect and mutual concern between individuals and between, you know, communities, between nations. Um, so, okay, so back to the, to the question though, uh, if the couple breaks up, should they cut ties or stay in touch? I don't know, I think the question is more like, well, well, I guess I can say, they definitely shouldn't hold a grudge towards each other. You know, they shouldn't, you shouldn't hold on to like re resentment and vengeance, that is, really destructive right even if you don't even if you decide you don't want to stay in touch with each other at least have you know wholesome intention may whatever happens may they be well right may things go well for them whether that involves me or not doesn't matter but um um but yeah then you have to measure other things like what look at what what seems to be what what are dangers are there dangerous that problems will arise if you stay in touch like you, if one one of the people has really out of control attachment then they stay in touch will that be a problem for them you know then then maybe it's better not um or if one is like really really has a real problem with loneliness and depression and if they don't stay in touch at all is it possible they'll, they'll become suicidal or something then maybe better to keep some contact you know just to 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 make sure the person doesn't feel totally bad so you have to just check. There's all different sort of scenarios, right? Okay. Other questions? Well, he raised his hand, so and you had a question, right? Go with him. What's your name? Akash. Okay. Mm. Okay. And this can be applied to like anything in the world because we have relationships with anything, like. You, I know you are talking about couples and all, but if you look at it in a way, I have a relationship with this family, with this boat, mm. with everything. Yeah. So suppose if you want to do something and you do, you, you take the action, 
and if the results the outcome does like does not meet our expectation mm -hmm. so that that is the like way this can be yeah, that is the like major cause of suffering yes but the first if i now think about it why i wanted to do the auction uh, because i was going to as you said that like uh, all the sentient beings know only two things either they like uh, relieve from suffering or move towards wealth so i was going towards the wealth mm. and now if i keep trying at this thing and it still does not meet my uh, expected outcomes mm. it, it keeps on suffering mm. so what should i do then Okay, let me just repeat your question to make sure I got it and you know, so that people online can hear. So you're saying, um, yeah, as a, as a person, we have relationships not only with other individuals, like in a couple relationship or family friends, but we have relationships with anything, any, any, any inanimate object like a watch or a pen. Or, we also have a relationship with that. We have a relationship with everything else that exists. It's true. I agree. And then, uh, so what happens when in relation to something else, you have you act with in you act in relation to that other thing and you have some expectation or some um hope that something will happen and then that doesn't happen and you suffer because you're disappointed right then what do you do in that case especially if there's something you really want to um to to happen or and you keep trying and it keeps not happening then and you keep suffering due to disappointment than what you do, right? Okay. So, you. Um, well, again, I mean, that's quite a, I mean, it's a very, you, it's a very abstract kind of question that covers many, many bases, right? So, whereas most of the situations we deal with, they're more like, they're a lot more specific, right? So, there's all different kinds of ways to answer based on you know different specific circumstances i'm not sure how to answer in uh, the abstract okay. so the like ending mode would be like should i keep doing that thing or like should i leave it and let go of it like yeah um, i don't know you have to check i mean generally if you know uh like you don't want to keep beating your head against the wall right like if if the other the, the reasons you have to check well why why is the thing you why is the result you want not coming about right if you keep if you try something to get a certain result and the result doesn't come about then if you do the same thing again it's not likely that result will come about right so something has to change because i mean it's everything that arises it arises through through causes and conditions through a set of causes and conditions coming together. And you know, for everything, there's a specific set of causes and conditions that have to come together for that to arise. Like you were talking about like a pen or something. So to make a pen, you can't just take like a stalk of corn and a glass of water and, and just rub your head and expect you're gonna get a pen. Like that's not the causes and conditions that produce a pen. Like you need like some ink and a little tube and then you know a little metal piece or something and then put them all together and then you get a pen. So so you have to check well what what is it that you desire and to accomplish that what are the requisite causes to bring about the result? The, what is the result that you desire to get? And to get that kind of result, what are the causes that you need to bring about to get that kind of result. So when you when you know when you want a certain result and you try something and that result's not happening, it means some of the causes are absent, right? Whether and there's all different kinds of causes, right? So you have to check. You know, in a relationship with another person, like the, the scenario that pops to mind when you mention this is because it so often happens where we really like another person, we'd really like to spend more time with them. And maybe be you know more close, more intimate with them, but they're not interested. And we try all different kinds of things, you know, like there's all kind of love songs and movies about all the things you can try to like be closer to another person. And if none of them work, well, maybe that's just because they're just fundamentally not interested in us, right? That's you know, of, of why would we expect you know of all the other 7 billion people in the world, how many of them are we interested in? So how can we expect the ones we're interested in, the chances that they're also gonna be interested in us are very low, you know? Um, so 
yeah so that's that's one expectation that's one that's one kind of uh, scenario where we that we often face and i think you know in that situation it's probably wise is just to i mean once we try everything we can at some point just to recognize yeah it's better to try in relation to another person you know and then not you know if not spend i mean how many how many tragic tragic stories are there are people who've spent their whole life trying to be with this one person one person never wants to be with them and then you know they they die in misery something like that you don't, you don't want to be that person right um so whereas you know there are other people who you know any any of us there are other people who will be you know attracted and, and be interested and want to spend time with us we just have to find you know just have to spend time finding that 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 place where there's recipro reciprocity you know where there's reciprocal it's mutual like i'm interested in them they're all the same interested in me then then there's so much possibility you know um but and in terms of a job, I mean, the same thing would be in terms of relation to a job, career. You know, I, there's a certain kind of career that I, I want to have. Like, I'm going to open up a restaurant that I try, and then that doesn't happen, try, and doesn't happen. Um, you know, sometimes it's karma also. That's where psychology doesn't talk about. Buddhism talks about sometimes, like, you just don't have the, the karma, like, to, to have one kind of career. Like, it just doesn't work. So it's better just to try something else um yeah i don't know any other scenarios you you like to imagine and any other questions from you people in zoom room also but you can put it in a way like suppose you you want to be a some kind of person and that requires some skill that you need to develop but because of some reason, we are not able to develop that skill. Mm. Yeah, it can be also applied to that. So you can't become that person because you don't have that skill. You can't? Can you repeat that? Like you had some, uh, you're thinking like, I will be like sometime in a few years, I'll become that person. Mm. To become that, I have to need to do these things. Right. And suppose these things. They are actually not in our control. Right. So mm -hmm. this kind of right to death. Yeah. But then isn't this mm -hmm. like you're not becoming that and you thought that if I would become that, I would be like moving towards the well being, I would be um, mm -hmm. feel good. Yeah. And if you don't do that, do something else. Mm -hmm. Isn't that like settling like I don't know? We're giving up. Giving up, yeah. Uh well see this is this is like it's it's your way of mentally framing it. I mean, if you mentally frame it like, and, and I think people, a lot of people suffer a lot because of this, like they get too fixated on one thing. Like, I want to be that. If I can't be that, then I'm a failure. You know, that's not a healthy way to, to frame. And it's not re realistic. It's not reality. Like, and it's being too narrow minded. I think we can, you know, be too fixated on, you know, I want to do this, 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 and then I'm going to be a doctor, right? But then we, you know, maybe we can't get into medical school. Even we get into medical school, but we, we get too much anxiety. So we can't, and we have too many health problems. So we can't do the internship or whatever. Some kind of obstacles arise so that we can actually finish and become a doctor. And then instead of, but we just keep, instead of just recognizing that there's obstacles to that happening, it's just not going to happen. Instead of and then and then instead of recognizing that and redirecting our energy, we keep banging our head against the wall. We keep trying to do this thing, which is just not going to happen, right? Like in one, in Tushita, you went to Tushita, right? I think I heard you mention. Yeah, one time I was teaching a course at Tushita, and there was there was a young woman there who she was having a similar kind of. Her thing was she was she was trying to take. I think it's the civil exams to become. Civil servant, civil service exams, yeah, ISS, which is like how many percent of people pass those? It's like less than one percent, point something, something, yeah, one percent. And she she had been taking them like seven years, something. She had taken it so many times, and she was preparing to take it again, and really wondering like how long should I keep doing this? You know, she was in her late twenties or something, and some people in her family were like telling her like just give up, just do something else. Like you're not gonna. You're not going to pass it, but she was like, no, 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 no. 
So, I mean, it's a similar kind of situation, like how long do you keep trying? I mean, there is an element, you don't want to just give up without having really tried. But I guess it, there's one helpful, maybe this is helpful. There's a helpful uh, consideration in, the, in, in Buddhism where, you know, in any situation when we're trying to decide what to do, we have to look at what, you know, what is beneficial? What's the kind of level of benefit and the amount of benefit that can potentially be gained? And what is the amount of harm that can potentially arise? So, you know, when you're trying to do something really hard, like pass the simple service exams, at the beginning, you know, there's a huge possible benefit because if you pass, you get this great job for life. You know, I'm really good, you're set, right? You made really good living. Um, and, and by preparing for the exams, you probably learn a lot, I guess, I don't know. Um, but then if you keep like not passing, not passing, not passing after, you know, years, say seven years or so, then, you know, it's like, the, it looks like if you haven't passed so many times, the likelihood that you're eventually going to pass probably drops. I mean, because either you, there's something that just doesn't, you've been trying to bring together the causes and conditions to pass, but it, maybe you just don't have the ability, right? Basically, or I don't know what, but but it looks like if it looks like you're trying to bring together the causes and conditions to be able to pass, but it's not happening, and you keep investing time in just that and not investing time in an alternative, then that can become harmful. That that you you become you know you're aging and you're not really getting experience in any other career track. Then the longer you do that. The, the more likely that you're just not going to get another good job, I guess, or something, isn't it? Um, so it can, there's a potential, the potential harm increases and the potential benefit decreases, right? So you have to take this equation. What's the potential benefit and what's the potential harm, right? When the potential benefit is significantly higher, yeah, keep trying. But when the potential harm is outweighing the potential benefit, better give it up and try something else where there's, you know, the, uh, more potential for a benefit, right? So, yeah, there. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like it's like you said. You have to benefit. You have to balance that. You know, um, what do you say? Uh, determination with pragmatism, right? On the one hand, it's it's good to be determined to do something, but it's also pragmatic to recognize at some point, like that's just not going to work. I should do something else. That where there's greater greater potential for, for benefit and success, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. One guy he says, you know, I think when the Buddhist thing is persevere, but let it go when it causes you suffering, when you begin to realize that sort of doing something. Mm -hmm. The other thing, like you mentioned very nicely, you need to resolve issues at some point of time. Otherwise, it can be very self destructive can't go on. It's going to go on with your life. The other thing is, I think somebody was mentioning, you know, when you start chasing happiness or chasing people, they tend to go away. Mm. You have to just give some space and time. Mm. Uh, that's what I have come across. And the third thing, the part, the last of it is, you know, the kind heart. I found there are three points. One is be um, encouraging. Be appreciated. Even if you want to give negative feedback, be appreciated, fortified. The second is be encouraging in whatever they are doing. And the third will be motivating for the future. Mm. So if you make anybody not, because ultimately it's not only your happiness, it is even growth for both. Both have to see the benefits. Mm. What I have come across. Yes, thank you. Any um Okay, it looks like no more questions online. Any more questions? Make off or stay in touch. I think sometimes when you stay in touch, it can hinder new relationships. It can hinder new relationships. Mm, that's true. Good. They may get back in touch later once mm. they learn. Mm, yeah, 
you know, sometimes to change the way you relate to each other needs just to not be in touch for a while. Attached to someone. Yeah, yeah, true. Yes, thank you for those with experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't we conclude here then? I think it's uh, there's not really much time for more meditation. A few minutes left, so let's just dedicate. So, thinking, uh, yeah, by whatever merit we've created through this, uh, yeah, this session. On how to live happily, and well, before, well, we're gonna we'll continue tomorrow. Um, yeah, I've only gone through just a tiny bit of the material I was wanting to go through, so we'll probably continue in some future weekend as well. But what, by whatever merit we've created, so remember, when we're speaking about how the purpose of a relationship is to have happiness. Um, and one one main thing essential for happiness is having a good heart, a kind heart. Um, and so we need to combine that with uh, insight to check to see you know what what brings about problems and what brings about um, benefit and happiness. So by yeah by whatever positive energy or merit we've created, then we dedicate that may all sentient beings. All the human beings, all the hell beings, hunger ghost animals, uh, gods and demigods, whatever beings exist whatsoever, may they all be free from every form of suffering. Especially in the world, may we be free from the sufferings from uh, you know, climate change and natural disasters, droughts, floods, especially the floods in Pakistan these days. There's so much. Uh, you know, so many people have lost their homes, lost their fields, lost their livestock, lost their livelihoods. Uh, may they quickly be able to rebuild their lives. May the waters quickly recede there. And then in other places like um, China, I read the other day, there's, and you know, in parts of the US, there's severe drought in parts of Europe. So may all those places where there's drought, may they quickly receive rainfall. And as a human uh, community, may we quickly be able to reduce and eliminate, you know, stop polluting the um, the air, you know, with carbon dioxide and methane and other gases which cause global warming. And then be able to stop cutting down the, the forests in different places. Um, and be able to renew, you know, restore the environment, planting trees, um, developing green, you know, green energy. And then also may we able, be able to uh, Reduce violent conflict like the war in Ukraine, violent conflicts in uh, Africa, other countries, and even you know domestic abuse and bullying. So, as a human community, may we be able to um, bring about universal compassion, loving kindness, mutual respect, and concern among all. And also with the, the uh, uh, with four animals. Mm -hmm. And then may all the teachings, Buddhist teachings and others that bring about uh, well-being and fitness, may they continue to prosper and flourish in all parts of the world. And may especially our, our teachers, as well as Dalai Lama, Lanzo, Mishra, and others, have long and stable lives and all their holy wishes be fulfilled. And then bring to mind any special intentions you have for people you know um, or special intentions that you have, bring them to mind. Mm -hmm. Just may all the sick be healed, the hungry be fed, the homeless have shelter, the naked have clothing. And may all your, your particular intentions, your wholesome intentions, be fulfilled in according to your wishes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to see you again soon. So we'll continue this tomorrow morning at 10 and the 12. Mm -hmm. okay. Take care. Bye-bye.